was just curious. Okay, so last week we talked about people who are being detached from the world. As that process is unfolding and they still have to be in the world, how are they able to cope with that being in the world? You know that painting on the wall? It's my brother-in-law's. He didn't paint it, but when he moved to Roseville, he had brought this from Iowa with him, or Idaho. And he was going to throw it away. And uh, it's a really, really nice painting. And I was always wanted to live in a place like that, you know. It's the only house you see. It's probably like the next house you can find nearby is probably like a few states away. And usually when I sit in this room and I just look at that painting constantly, sometimes I wonder how one survives. Will they have a dog, you know? Will they have a horse or a cat or some pet? But the first thing is, why would anyone desire to leave the city and move to a place like that? You know, it's a great place. It's forests, mountains in the back, snow, beautiful trees, nice little pond. You know, there could be several reasons. It could be like... You know, someone was very close to their mom or their dad, and they passed away. And it was just too much for them. It was too much anger, too much hatred, perhaps. Uh, Profoundly disappointed by, you know, life taking away their parents. And they happen to be in a position of privilege where they, you know, have some money where they go and buy a cabin like that, and they live in the woods. Uh, you know, simply because they can't understand why God or life would take someone they love so much away from them. Uh, It could also be the outcome. I mean, it's a very lonely place where you look at it. I mean, it, it looks great when you look at it from a distance as a painting. And you begin to kind of have all these fantasies about yourself living there. But, you know, if you've been in city and have lived in the city for, like me, for about 50, 60 years, the idea of going into seclusion, living by yourself somewhere in the forest, I think as an idea it sounds great. As a reality, I think it's a horrifying process. Uh, Because you have to detox, and like any addiction, You know, you're going to have relapses. You're going to be consumed by anger and hatred. You're going to doubt, I mean, why did I move from uh, this city to this place? Uh, You must have really come to some profound understandings about yourself, about life, where You know, you kind of sell everything, you move into the forest, you build yourself a nice little cabin, and uh, you know, you have no desire to go back to the city except to buy food, you know. I think if you're hurt and you want to exercise detachment, I think Aristotle has a nice way of putting it, that, you know, in in life, you either become a beast or you become a god. You become a beast when you're hurt, and It starts as an uncomfortable feeling, then it turns into 
it morphs into pain then the blaming starts then the anger starts then the hatred starts and then the hatred lives inside your soul and it leaks everywhere then you lose your ability to trust to be close to be intimate it doesn't mean you won't have friends it doesn't mean you won't be physically intimate with people uh, on the surface you look very normal and you do things that everybody does but inwardly you live in a castle and you don't allow anyone in and rarely do they do you go out uh, first because you know there was this book long time ago it was uh, written by a radio talk show host I forget the name of the author but and you may have read it it's called um, A Knight in a Rusty Armor and the book is about um, it's maybe 20-30 pages it's about the knight who goes into the battlefield every morning comes home removes the armor takes a shower and spends some time with the kids and his wife and there comes a point where and you know you're talking about I don't know, 12th, 13th century. Uh, to put on an armor, you have to kind of... It has, I don't know, a thousand nuts and bolts. And it becomes difficult every day taking everything off and putting it back on. So he just decides not to remove the armor. You know, and it happens to be winter. So he goes out in the morning and it's snowing or raining and it's cold and freezing. And he fights, you know, comes home and he's smelly, bloody, and just puts the garden hose, you know, through this visor, and kind of shakes the dirt off of him and goes back in. And there comes a point where the wife says to him, you know, I haven't seen your face. I mean, I haven't, uh, you haven't hugged me. You haven't hugged the kids without the armor on for months. Take it off. And he says, no, you know, I am the knight of the king. You should have more respect when you talk to me. The king loves me. And the woman, you know, through his relatively wacky logic, kind of just submits and says, okay. Some weeks or months pass by, and the woman again, the, his wife, goes to him and says, I haven't seen your face because now the visor won't even move. So she hasn't seen his eyes or his face, what little you can see. And the kids haven't seen you. And she's really upset at this point, and she gives him an ultimatum, which is, if you don't remove this armor in a week's time, we'll just leave, and you won't see us again. Maybe he thinks she's bluffing. Maybe he just doesn't care. I don't know. Uh, you know the, the saying, you begin to appreciate things only when you lose them. Mm. So he goes out, fights, come, comes back home, and there is no sign of them. You know, he goes to the bedrooms, and all the clothes have been packed, and it's empty. At first, he doesn't much care because he's tired. He goes to sleep. He wakes up, goes into the battlefield. A few days pass by, and he just begins to miss his family. But he can cope with that. He goes back out, he comes home, and he's just sitting on the floor. And then he comes to realize it's not that just his wife or his kids have not seen his face. He hasn't seen his face. He had lived in this armor for such a long time that he had forgotten what he looked like. And he tried to get the armor off. It's like going to therapy, you know. But first, he didn't have the right tools. Second, all the nuts and bolts were rusted. And kind of like Peter, you know, in the Gospels, he cries out and he wants help. He wants somebody to help him in removing the armor so he can once again catch a glimpse of himself and hopefully he can go you know search for his wife and kids and bring them back home 
but he doesn't know what to do. You know, he doesn't have the tools to get the armor off, so he falls into depression. And at the darkest uh, moment of that particular emotion, Merlin appears to him, and you know, it's a magician. And Merlin says to him, I've been told that you want to remove the armor, is it true? He says, yes. He said, is it just a desire? Is it just a passion, a passing thing? Or do you really, really want to remove the armor? He says, I really, really want to remove the armor. And then he says to him that, you know, once the armor is removed, you can no longer be a knight. You will no longer be favored by the king. You will no longer go to the battlefield. You will no longer find the validation of your identity through that. Are you ready for all of those things? These are things he never thought about, you know, but after giving it some thought for a few days, Merlin comes back and, you know, the knight says, I am ready. He says, okay, well then, if that's the case, I'm going to move you into the house of silence, you know. And what's difficult about the house of silence is that, you know, imagine you're 50. Um, and though physically there is no one around you, you're haunted by the memories, by the thoughts, by the fears, by all the emotions that you've either expressed or repressed. It doesn't really matter. Eventually, one by one, they're going to come out. And you have to get to a place of silence, which means that memories come and memories go, and they won't impact you. Thoughts come and thoughts go, until a point where there are no memories left. They just don't care. They no longer define who and what you are. Uh, your history becomes completely irrelevant, you know. And then once that happens, he sees or feels the armor being loosened a little. Merlin comes back at this point, and that's like 20 years away. And says to the, the knight that you've done a good job. You know, it's taken you a while, about 20 years, but you're there. So let's move you now to a different house. And it's called the House of Wisdom. You know, I think the book calls it the House of Knowledge. It may be the same in that book. And now he's given tools, and now he's being shown how to apply the tools so that the armor can be unbolted. Uh, and I'm going to add on to the story because it's not in the book. And so after like 15, 20 years, all the nuts and bolts, you know, are removed and the armor falls to the ground. For the first time in many, 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 many years, he sees his face, he sees his body. And it takes time for him to, you know, adjust to all the things that he sees. And then once he is adjusted, you know, he goes looking for his wife and his kids and eventually finds them, brings them back home. You know, some people find detachment or possess detachment or are consumed by detachment because they are like the night. Uh, it is true that you know, he initially got depressed because his wife and kids left him. But his depression kind of really exploded when he came to realize he hasn't seen himself, you know. And then he had to figure out who he is, what he is, and what he wants to do with all of that. Yeah. There comes a point, I suppose, when you look at the painting, you say, it could have been someone who lives in New York or someone who lives in Oakland or someone who lives in the center of the hustle and bustle of a city. And, you know, like Dante, they come to realize that they are in the middle of the years, they're in the woods, and it's dark and it's frightening. And they say, you know, the city life is good. It has safe way. You know, it has all the conveniences of life, all the comforts of life. But I don't think I can belong here anymore. We don't know why. 
you know, and kind of like the knight who wants to get rid of the armor, you have to get rid of the city life, and all the desires and ambitions and hopes and goals and, you know, the various meanings it gives you, and it's a very, very difficult place to be, and you can't really be intimate with detachment, and you can't live with detachment if we don't have real understanding, if we don't know why you moved out of the city in the first place. You know, it's kind of like one of those things that the Catholics go through the priests, which is, sure, at the age of 18 or 19, you watch the movie Stigmata, and you say, yeah, I want to serve God, and I want to serve God's creation, whether it's a horse or, you know, a human being. You know, and at the age of 18, inspiration is really good, you know, uh, you go to the Vatican, you serve your time, uh, and then the inspiration becomes a routine. On a daily basis, you wake up, you read some passages, you kind of pray, you sit quietly, and then you go, you give your sermon. And as your life becomes more and more routine, you become more and more human. And all the desires that you never thought you would ever have eventually come to you. And so, you know, and all the horror stories that come out of the Vatican about priests doing this to this kid, you know, the other one doing that to that kid. You know, you move into priesthood without truly understanding the function of the human body and its needs. And when you self-deceive or when you lack proper understanding, all those things will eventually come to visit you you know, the human part, the, uh, you begin to covet, you begin to exercise greed, lust, uh, you know, you become profoundly arrogant, you know, all the seven deadly sins that you're supposed to kind of get rid of, they really become a huge army, and they come on, you know, the attack, and you don't stand the chance, you basically fall. You know, for someone like Aristotle, he would say that someone who truly has an understanding and says to himself or herself after a long life of self-examination, says to him or herself, I don't think I want to get married. You know, that must have come from a place where you recognize something about yourself, about your needs, about your capacities. And whether or not it stays true, no one knows because when you make a choice, you get tested. You know, uh, it's like, you know, you're getting your master's or PhD in hopes of being in a classroom and teaching. And in your head, you think yourself to be a great teacher and no one knows, you know, you may be. And then you walk in the classroom and that is where the test is. There you realize how much worth you know, uh, how much your salt is worth. And then you can't deceive anymore, you know, self-deceive. You thought yourself to be Socrates or Plato or Jesus Christ, and you realize, no, you're just a person with a lot of animation, with a lot of data. Uh, you really look good on the stage, but outside of the stage, like Al Pacino, Keith Ledger, the rest of them, you just become a drunk because it's tough. It's tough to kind of create your own life and not have it be plagiarized, not having a script, you know. Aristotle calls those people close to being a god because they have so little need for other people. They have so little need for places like, say, for your Costco, you know. They can kind of self-sustain uh, you know Saeed's father has passed he passed away some years ago and I had known him casually of course you know he was much older than I was and uh, so it's at least in our culture it's not that easy to kind of uh, become close to people who are like twice your age 
But I remember from the time I met him, which was, I think, in the 80s, perhaps, I never saw him have a conversation when we were at gatherings. He would just sit. Uh, he would look around. And there were moments I just looked at him and I said to myself, he's really just making fun of us. You know, all of us talking about politics and religion or some of us singing or playing music. He's kind of just sitting back, you know, um, looking at the rest of us saying, these punks, they have no idea what they're talking about and yet they keep rambling on. Um, I think in the course of knowing him for almost 40 years, maybe, uh, or 35 years, maybe I heard him talk um, four or five times. I spoke a few more times to my father because they were, you know, from the same kind of time period. And, uh, they both enjoyed politics and religion. I must confess I have forgotten your question, um, but I'm just going to kind of just focus on the key word, which was detachment. You know, pain makes you really, really focused. It doesn't matter what kind of pain it is, whether it's a physical pain, or whether uh, you're dealing with a pain that you experienced some years ago and it just haunts you day and night, uh, or whether it's like an intellectual pain, which is you're trying to figure out all the subtleties of the allegory of the king, you know, or you're trying to figure out what the hell was Wittgenstein talking about? you know, about language and the fly in the bottle and all that stuff. Uh, or you have some spiritual pain. The, the function of pain is that, especially if it's hitting a nerve, it won't let you focus on anything else except itself. Pain is profoundly selfish. It takes away, well, takes away all the other desires that may live inside you all the other frustrations that may live inside you, all the other ambitions, and it just forces you to focus on it. You just have a toothache. You don't care what happens to your math class, you don't care what happens to your boyfriend, you don't care what happens to your kids, you have a toothache and it just won't leave you alone, and it's painful. And I think if you focus on those moments where the pain is really, really intense. You don't much care about anything. You're completely detached. You know, all you say to yourself probably is, I knew I should have flossed every night. I should have brushed every night. Uh, you know, I remember going to Iran a few times. I get airsick. And so, 10 minutes into the flight, I start throwing up. And from, you know, San Francisco to Iran, you go to Germany, and from Germany you go to Iran. It's about a 15, 16 hour flight. And I, in the morning I don't eat anything before, you know, at night time I don't have dinner either. And on the plane, I don't eat anything because I just get air sick, which means I throw up. And I usually throw up when I, you know, get in the air maybe 200 times. Nothing comes out because my stomach is empty. But the pain becomes so much that, and I'm not joking, I literally pray for the aeroplane to explode so I could die. Mm. I don't care for anything. I am completely detached from everything about life, including life itself. You know?
So you move into detachment because of the initial pain. But the story doesn't end there. It becomes far more complicated when you're detached. It has become a way of life, but it is no longer in pain, no longer rooted in pain, which means that there's a good chance that once the pain goes away, you'll go back to being the person that you are which is you love the city life, you are over your mom having passed, or your boyfriend or girlfriend having broken up with you, and the tornado inside has kind of quieted down, and now you go back. Um, only to experience the same thing again, you know. You know, there is, this, there is this guy, his name is John Butler, if I'm not mistaken. He's an old guy. He, he's English, I think. Um, I don't know if he's dead or alive now, but he also wrote a book. I don't even know what the book is called. It's not that interesting, at least for me. But um, He was married, I think, and he had children. And um, he used to sit and meditate. And in his meditation, he had an experience, whether it was a figment of his imagination or something that was actually real, I, I don't know. But he thought it to be real and true. And it was so intense for him that he could no longer relate to his wife. He could no longer relate to his kids. He could no longer relate to anything that life uh, had to offer him. He couldn't connect to anything, you know. And it's it's a funny thing because when you realize that you are Pegasus, this this winged horse, and you can fly, you will no longer you're no longer willing to go down and walk with people. You can fly, you know. Why the hell would you want to come down here and be agitated by? people who lack understanding because life simply doesn't afford them time, the privilege to sit and think or to even be interested. So he kind of just flies up there by himself. Uh, you know, the, the problem with detachment for him and for anyone, I suppose, is, you know, we're human beings. We go through mood swings, things about, you know, our intellectual life changes, our emotional life changes, and you have a bad day. And the question is, when you have a bad day, are you just going to throw everything away and just go back to the city saying, I, I, this is too much for me, I can't do it, you know? Or are you going to be a stoic, you know, saying that this too shall pass, I'm just going to try my best to quiet things down, 